keeping us safe. Thank you for keeping us whole. Thank you for keeping us, period. Uh, because it had not been for your grace and mercy, Lord, none of us would exist. And we should all, each and every one of us should realize that. So for that, Lord, I just say thank you. I thank you for what you're about to do this day uh, with this lesson. I ask that you continue to open up our minds that we may be receptive to this lesson, open our hearts that we may internalize it, and ultimately you get the praise, glory, and honor that you are due as a result of us sharing our part of this lesson with others because you are such an awesome God, and we can't make it without you. Lord, I love you, bless you, praise you, and magnify you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. The title of our lesson is, Does Jesus Care? And the answer to that is, yes, he cares. Uh, we're in a series called Why? And today's focus is, Why Didn't God Answer My Prayer? When we encounter people... Uh, in any capacity, we usually are bringing our baggage to the to the party. If you're in the grocery store, uh, if you're in the checkout line, if you getting gas, if you just interacted with anybody else. You need to remember or you need to be reminded that somebody around you either has a problem that they're going through or they're in a situation that they don't know what to do. Many times when we go through some things, uh, we forget and when we go to interact with those around us, we go to interact with our fist up. But we need to realize that sometimes when people are lashing out, they've gone through something. Um, and that poses its share of problems within itself. Now. When we get to the church house, usually what we do is we put on what we call our church face. We put on that smile that everything is all right, even though our world is falling apart. The expression there is we fake it till we make it. Now, as leaders, and each of us are leaders, we need to be reminded that people are hurting. And we have no way of knowing many times who is hurting or how much they're hurting. People don't talk about their situation many times because we talk. We share things. Well, correction, people share things not for you to gossip with or gossip about. They just need to know that they can share. And God wants us to help and heal the hurting through our actions. Some situations that we only think, uh, so, some situations that people are in, we only think of curves on TV. Um, but there are some people, remember, we just got out of the series, the winter season. Um, people don't know when their winter season is going to be over. Uh, such as those who have lost a parent. We can easily, those of us that have lost a parent, can easily talk to someone who has lost a parent especially if it's something recent. Uh, those of us that have been in a relationship for a while can help somebody that has that little itchy divorce finger, uh, especially if their divorce is because of poor communication. Could be that there's some nagging that's going on that needs to cease. 
some listening that needs to take place. We are called to comfort one another because we have been put in a situation to comfort someone else. Second Corinthians chapter 1, uh, verses 3 through 5 says, Praise be to God the and Father of Jesus, our Lord Jesus Christ. God is the Father who is full of mercy and all comfort. He comforts us every time we have trouble. So when others have trouble, we can comfort them with the same comfort God gives us. And we all know, <laughs> I'm thankful about, we all know that God will give us some comfort. We share in the many sufferings of Christ in the same way much comfort comes to us through Christ. Well, our lesson, our series is entitled, Why? Why? Why doesn't he answer my prayer? Does he care? If he cares so much, then why didn't he answer my prayer? If he cares, does he know? So, after someone experiences some kind of sadness or some kind of sorrow, they will eventually find a sweet relief in knowing that the hand of the Lord is there. Now, many times when we've gone through something, we've called on him, we've claimed the promises, we've called our prayer warrior buddies, uh, but it still seems like he doesn't care or that he's silent or doesn't answer. So after today, hopefully we will have better insight as to why a prayer might not be answered. Um, and it's not because God doesn't know and it's not because God doesn't care. Remember last week in the story of Martha, Lazarus, and Mary? Uh, Martha and uh, Martha and Mary had sent word to Jesus that the one he loved is sick and near death. And what did he do? He just immediately got on his... No, he didn't immediately do anything. He stayed for two more days. Because we're looking at this from this side of that situation. We know that it is more gloriful for God to raise a dead man than it is to heal a sick man. But when you're going through and you're praying and he doesn't answer or he is silent, that sometimes puts folks at odds with trying to understand anything. Psalm 22 and 2 says, My God, I cried all day long. During the day, Good News Version says, During the day, I call you, my God, but you do not answer. I call at night, but I get no rest. That means you just laying there tossing and turning. And then John 15 and 7 says, if you remain in me and follow my teachings, you can ask anything you want and it will be given to you. Well, I've done that and still you're not answering. Well, in life, we're all going to face some setbacks one way or another. Now, my setback might not be the same as yours, but we're still going to face some pain some loneliness, some disappointments, some rejection, or some sickness. But through it all, we're going to find that there is sweet relief in knowing that the hand of the Lord is there to lean on. Uh, and once again, well, what do you do when you call on him and he doesn't answer? Well, Matthew 15, uh, starting at verse 21, it says, Jesus took a trip to Tyre and Sidon. There they had hardly arrived when the Canaanite woman came down from the hills and pleaded, Mercy, 
Masters, son of David, my daughter is cruelly afflicted by an evil spirit. Now, she was not of the covenant people. And she cries out because she cares. She doesn't have an intimate relationship with Jesus. And you have to bear in mind Tyre and Sidon, that's idol country. But here she is calling out to Jesus because she has heard something about Jesus. And verse 23 is the most condemning verse of all. It says in the good, I mean, sorry, in the message translation, it says Jesus ignored her. Do what? Wait a minute. I, I'm, I'm coming to you and you, you ignoring me? Well, a Canaanite mother prayed, and she was confronted with a disinterested, disinterested Jesus, as it appears to us. Uh, a disconnected Jesus, because verse 24 tells us that Jesus responds, I got my hands full dealing with these lost sheep of Israel. You know, them stiff-necked people. And then we see a denying Jesus. Verse 26, he says, it's not right to take bread out of the children's mouths to throw it to the dogs. I, I ain't got time to be bothered with you. So it appears as if he doesn't have time for her. And there are times that we pray, and it seems like things get much worse. There are struggles that we go through that will prevent you from understanding why God doesn't answer our prayers. And we need to be, one of the things that we need to be at all times is open to his answer. Because it might not be the answer you want, but it's his answer. And how he's going to answer. He might not send Reverend Cosby. He might send a drunk walking, stumbling down the street. Might tell you, God loves you. Oh, go on somewhere, fool. You don't even know God. Look at you turning up your bottle. That That's our response. But we miss that word where... He said, God loves us. So that means in spite of everything that we've already done to God, God still loves us. My buddy Daryl Coley wrote, the word of the Lord says, what things soever you ask when you pray, believe it and it shall be done unto you. The word says, Abide in me and my word in you, then you can receive it and it shall be done unto you. Just keep the faith, then have patience, just wait, and I'll swiftly bring it to pass. It shall be done, whatever you need, it shall be done, and trust and believe it shall be done unto you. He says, if within your body sickness dwells, say, by his stripes I am healed, and even though the symptoms may, be, may prevail, know that your healing is the Lord's will. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. As you make your request known unto the Lord, have faith, expect your miracle, be ready to receive. Just keep on praying. Have faith, then start praising me, for it shall come to pass. It shall be done, it shall be done, it shall be done unto you. Well, here is that question, the first of many, for you to put your input in. How do you respond when it seems that the Lord has gone silent in answering your prayers? It seems like the more you pray, the worse it gets. How do you respond? Star six.
Let's hear from you. So you are telling me by your silence that God has always answered your prayers? Brother David, a lot of times, a lot of times, what I find myself doing is that uh, after I have my pity party, because it does hurt when I, it feels like he's not answering my prayers, I have my pity parties, and then I have to go to scripture. And a lot of times, uh, it may not come when I want him, but I know once he will answer, it'll be the right time. So. I try to get more patient, and I have to just wait on the Lord. I have to continue to tell myself that if I wait, then he's going to renew my strength. Okay, Sister Vanessa, now let me ask you another question. Since, uh, and I thank you for that answer. How do you explain that somebody who they've been praying they're kind of wobbly in their faith because you you are one of stronger faith than many. Uh, they're wobbly in their faith. How, how do you explain that you still just have to to trust? A lot of times, what I do is I just go back and relate to stories of you know of my life. Uh, you know, we wasn't born with a, a spiritual spoon in the mouth, so the, I reflect on a lot of the hills and valleys that I've gone through and that I've seen other people go through and just continue to tell them to be faithful and, and be there. You know, if they want to sound off, you know, they want to vent, I try to be there and just let them vent it out to me and then and with scripture. you got to keep taking them back to the Word. That's key and crucial. And I thank you for that. Because one of the things that we need to note is it's not until God gets the glory that we should get joy. God needs to raise up another generation of people to be able to go to the Word and to be able to call on God in prayer. We learned it from our ancestors. I remember my dad telling me he would have, I asked him about something. He said he would have an answer for me as soon as he got down from God's throne. And I looked at him. I was like, okay, you heading into the bathroom. What throne are you talking about for real? But that was my dad's prayer spot. Uh, that ends up being a prayer spot for many folk because that's just what they learn to do. You get away, you steal away, and you take it to God. And sometimes the only place you can steal away to God is in the bathroom because you're not going to find too many people knocking on the door trying to get in. Okay? Well, many people struggle with their faith. As Sister Vanessa said, you have to have faith because of God's silence and apparent impotence when they cry out to him in their greatest time of need because he doesn't seem to bother to answer them. They become baffled uh, because we can't explain why God didn't answer our prayers. If you ever get to someone asking you, why didn't God answer my prayers, but please, Please don't respond. Unless the Holy Spirit has put it on your heart to respond, don't respond. They become baffled. They become puzzled because they don't understand why God isn't responding. We start falling into this little silly trap that God doesn't love us or I've done something for God to hate me. And then they become disappointed. They become disappointed about God and his will. And that disappointment usually results, are usually the results of unmet expectations. 
us because many times we put expectations on God that God didn't promise. He didn't promise that he was going to heal my daddy, my grandmother, my, you know, he didn't promise that. In the healing, he didn't say he was going to heal them here. Uh, I remember my sister was agonizing over a pending heart surgery because that was the only way the doctor said she would be healed. But after she passed, I looked at her face, and there she was just smiling. And she looked at peace, and also I realized this is the healed body. I still got some other stuff to go through, but here is the healed body that she's been praying for. So in the case of prayer, our expectations are shaped in part by scriptures, such as Matthew chapter 21, uh, verse 21 and 22, where it says, and Jesus told him, I tell you the truth, if you have faith and don't doubt, faith don't doubt. You can do things like this and much more. You can even say to this mountain, may you be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and it will happen. You can pray for anything. If you have the faith, you will receive it. Now, promises like this from the lips of Jesus causes us to become a little confused when we don't get our prayers answered. God said, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, and I don't know about you, but mustard seeds are awfully small. Have faith, don't doubt. Now, Christians, we, we get to try to explain God. You're not seeking to please the Lord. Well, I'm trying. I'm doing everything I know to do. Or you have unconfessed sin in your life. Remember, that's what Job's friends told him. Or you're praying with, un, um, or with improper motives. You want her to go on and die so you can have her man. Or here's the big one. You just like faith. Well, and here's that faith thing, because everybody that's on here is either laying down or sitting in the chair. And I guarantee you not one of you bothered to flip that chair over or flip that bed over to guarantee that the screws were going to hold you. <laughs> before you plop down. So here gets to be that next question. If there's a lack of an answer to your prayers, it's based solely on you. So is that list correct? Star six to answer. Is our list correct? David Letterman yeah. used to have the top ten yep. things, and I look yep. at this as the top ten uh, reasons why some Christians say, and we're just missing a few more, that's all. But okay. That's, this is not a good list. <laughs> all righty. Everybody agree with Grace? What about when you're doing the best you can? I'm going to add one to this list. You're not holy enough. Is that list correct still? Okay, here we go. 
when we're living to to please him are more important to explain that God doesn't answer your prayers because you're not holy enough. Uh, it, it seems odd for a faith built upon grace. Romans 5 and 8 says, But God put his love on the line for us by offering his son in sacrificial death while we were of no use to him. In other words, we were still sinning. We were out there still uh, doing some things we shouldn't have been doing. Uh, so does that mean you have to work harder to get your prayers answered? No. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For it is by grace, God's grace, that you have been saved through faith. It is not the result of your own efforts. In other words, it's not works, but it's God's gift so that no one can boast about it. Now, when we start looking back at this Canaanite woman, the woman is not living to please the Lord, nor was she living her life to uh, please anybody other than herself. In fact, she was a sinner. And she was a shameful woman. She was noisy because other than a prostitute, a woman was, back in that day, a woman wasn't supposed to call on the man at all. Uh, and we're told that she even got on the disciples' nerves. Uh, the disciples came and complained to Jesus saying, now she's bothering us. Will you please take care of her? She's driving us crazy. So she wasn't seeking to please him, and she was kind of nervy. Who are you to call on Jesus in a country that practices worshiping idols? She was a descendant of the Canaanites, and you know the Canaanites, they raised Cain all night. She was no better than a dog, according to the Jews. So this woman was not holy, yet Jesus healed her daughter. He heard her prayer with all those strikes against him. Her, I'm sorry, with all the strikes against her. So then we get to Matthew chapter 15, verse 28. And that's when we see Jesus' response. Oh, woman, your faith is something else. What you want is what you get. Right then, her daughter became well. So, that's what it is. It's about faith. Remember, Jesus heals because he is holy, not because he heals those who he heals are holy. I repeat that. Jesus heals because he is holy, not because those who he heals are holy. She was a heathen, yet she got her request fulfilled. Uh, there are a couple of more examples. The centurion, uh, who, when he came to Jesus about his servant, he was a Gentile, yet he got his request answered. So what about this whole faith thing? Faith is important in our praying. Jesus said to this woman, had great faith. What is faith? Faith is the act of trusting God. Faith is believing that God hears and cares. Well, if he hears and cares, why didn't he answer my prayers? He didn't answer how you want. I keep telling people, uh, they're not lawyers, and you don't get to say, yes or no, Jesus, am I going to, will you do, it is not a yes or no situation. Our trust in God touches our heart. Here's our next question. How much faith do you need in order for your prayers to be answered? Well, we're going to see that answer in Mark chapter 9, starting in verse 21. Jesus asked the Father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he said. 
It has thrown him into the fire and the water many at a time to destroy him. If you can do anything, do help us. Do have pity on us. Jesus said to him, if you can, anything can be done for one who believes. Because many times belief, uh, if you believe, that's not why you've not got an answer. Verse 24. At once the father of the boy cried out, I do believe. Help my unbelief. Now, as Jesus saw the crowd was rapidly gathering, he checked the unclean spirit. Deaf and dumb spirit, leave him, I command you, and never enter him again. And it did come out. After shrieking aloud and convulsing him violently, the child turned like a corpse. So the people said, he's dead. Taking his hand, Jesus raised him, and he got up. So notice by the father's own admission, his faith was neither complete, was not complete where he wanted it, nor was it where he wanted it to be. He said, I believe, but help my unbelief. That's the same with us. We believe but then doubt starts walking awfully close to us. But yet and still, the man admitted it. Even though he admitted his faith was not where it needed to be, yet Jesus still healed the son. So, in fact, when Matthew records the incident, the disciples question as to why they couldn't heal the man. And once again, Jesus replied, you don't have enough faith. Tell you the truth, if you had faith even the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it would move. Nothing would be impossible. Good news, I mean, the message translation says, because you're not taking God seriously. The simple truth is, if you had a mere kernel of faith, a poppy seed, which is about the same as a mustard seed, you would say to this mountain, move, and it would move. There is nothing you wouldn't be able to tackle. So perhaps the answer is not uh, how we pray and how much faith we have, but our lack of understanding of what Jesus meant with the statements above. So, Many times in the Bible, and especially as Jesus was talking, he used a figure of speech called a hyperbole. And a hyperbole is an overstatement or exaggeration to make a point. And the Bible is full of hyperboles. Uh, life is full of hyperboles. We speak to them all the time. She's skinny as a toothpick. Or he's fat as an elephant. So, let's consider some of the examples of Jesus' use of hyperbole and why it is important to take him seriously, but not always literally. Let's look at when he was in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, verses 29 through 30. He says, so if your eye, even your good eye, causes you to lust, gouge it out and throw it away. It is far better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body to be thrown into hell. Uh, if that was the case, many of us would only have one eye. Verse 30, And if your hand, even your stronger hand, causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than the whole body to be thrown into hell. We would have a partially blind, handless society. Then Luke chapter 18, verse 25, he says, In fact, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter into the kingdom of God. 
Now, when a camel would try to go through a gate, many times they had to take the things off the camel's back. And then there were other times they had to have the camel to bend down and get on its knees. Well, that works for us too. There are many times that there are some things we need to take off. We need to take off our bitterness. We need to take off our insecurities. We need to take off our envy. We need to take off our rage, and sometimes we just need to take off plain old hatred. I don't hate anybody. Yes, you do. Sometimes you even hate yourself. It says that it's going to be easier for a camel to get through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom. What he's saying is that you need to seek God first in everything. Put him first. Put him in front of every relationship. Put him in front of everything. Because when we get to heaven, there are going to be some rich people there. And there are also going to be some poor people in hell. Matthew 21 and 22 says you can pray for anything, and if you have faith, you will receive it. Well, we start praying to the gods of the lottery, and I don't recall none of you that are on this call um, winning the lottery, especially that multi-million dollar one that was almost into the billions. Uh if you, Lord, if you just let me win the lottery, I promise I'm going to tithe. You're not tithing now. So, were these words a promise to be taken literally or mechanically? If they are, are, are they a hyperbole statement? Or is Jesus inviting his followers to boldly pray and pray with faith? He's not saying mutilate your body. He's not saying that you're just going to be one-eyed and one-handed. What he's wanting for you to do is take sin seriously. Cut out some things that are causing you to go astray because sin is serious. Can you imagine... You only got one good eye left, and here you go lusting after some things. Remember last week we talked about Satan's playbook in 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. It says, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Uh, those are the three things that are a part of Satan's playbook to to derail you. And so what do we do? We don't take a page from the playbook. What do we do? We fall for it every time. And as a result, uh, we give in to our sinful, selfish desires. We want what we want. We see people. What we see what other people have. We, we want that. Uh, everything that a people are so proud of, we want that because none of that comes from the Father. It's from the world. The message translation says, practically everything that goes on in the world, wanting your own way, wanting everything for yourself, wanting to appear important, has nothing to do with the Father. It just isolates you from him. So the kind of trust that God wants us to have uh, cannot be learned in comfort and ease. When God is teaching us a lesson, everybody that's on this call that's experienced the teaching of, of Jesus, he doesn't send us to a private school. He can afford it, but he doesn't send us to a private school. He sends us to the school of the hard knocks. 
Because the lesson he wants us to learn, the trust he wants us to have, doesn't come from a vending machine. It comes through the school of hard knocks. Look at Paul. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, because of the extravagance of those revelations, in other words, the revelation of him seeing the third heaven, and so I wouldn't get a big head. I was given the gift of a handicap to keep me constantly in touch with my limitations. Satan's angel did his best to get me down. What he in fact did was push me on my knees. No danger then of walking around high and mighty. At first, I didn't think of it as a gift and begged God to remove it. Three times I did that, and then he told me, my grace is enough. It's all you need. My strength comes into its own in your weakness. Once I heard that, I was glad to let it happen. I quit focusing on the handicap and began appreciating the gift. It was a case of Christ's strength moving in on my weakness. So that what does that require? It requires some patience. It requires time. And the time goes to patience, and that patience goes to suffering. Oh, I don't want to suffer. And then there's that pressure of desperation. Because it's not until our back is up against the wall that we get strong. Proverbs twenty thirty says sometimes it takes a painful situation to make us change our ways. And there comes a time when we need to change our ways. Notice that God would not heal Paul, but God would help him deal with the struggle. Struggle. He said that um, his strength was made perfect in his weakness. Now, imagine you say goodnight to your child as he's leaving. God puts it on your heart to start listening to police scanner uh, because that's how you usually would go to sleep. And as you lay there listening, all of a sudden, you discover that there's been a body found in the alley near you. And then the ID is revealed that it's your child. And then the fool that did the shooting was his best friend. What does God do? God will help you deal with the death of your son and then turn around and give you the ability to forgive the person that killed your son. So God will give us the strength to endure or provide a way of escape. He will come through. He'll give you the strength to do one or provide that way of escape because he's going to come through. Remember in the Daryl Coley song, he said, Know that your healing is the Lord's will. I, I will never forget my sister's healed body because that's what she wanted. She wanted to be healed. Paul came to see that every insult, every disaster, Every stressful situation was an opportunity for God to work in perfecting his soul and in accomplishing good through him. Because he says, when I'm weak, that's when I'm made strong. We see with Jesus. If Jesus had to pray, what, what about you? Luke chapter 22, verse 42, Jesus says, Father, if you're willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. And then he says, yet I want your will to be done, not mine. The writer of Psalm 22, quoting Jesus, or Jesus was quoting that psalm, 
when he said, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why are you so far away when I groan for help? Then we see in Matthew chapter 27, verse 46, he says, At about three o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabbathani, which means, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? The Father asked, I mean, the Savior asked the Father, why have you abandoned me? Now, we're looking at that on this side of the cross, and we know that God did not forsake him, but God favored us. God said, I was willing to give up my son for you to live. Now, What do those two New Testament accounts of unanswered prayer teach us? They teach us that God does not always answer our prayers, even when we offer those prayers in faith at times of real and pressing need. Doesn't mean that he doesn't care. They also teach us that while God may not answer our prayers as we pray them, God does not abandon us. He gives us strength to endure or to help us find a way of escape. They also tell us that God works through situations from which we have not been delivered as we ask. Paul's handicap, Paul's thorn was an opportunity for the power of God to be displayed in him and for his faith to be deepened. Jesus' crucifixion became the most powerful sign of God's sacrificial love and human redemption in history. Uh, To this day, you'll see Sunday when we have communion. Something happens when you talk about the cross. (laughs) Something happens when you talk about the blood. Because it became God's vehicle for salvation of the human race. If Jesus hadn't died, we wouldn't be living. If he didn't abandon or forsake Christ, uh, we would not be favored to this day. It's the hardship, challenges, and suffering and tragedy that will lead most to develop a character and compassion. Because when we've gone through something, that's when we have compassion for those that have gone through something. When you've been homeless, you have an affinity for the homeless. When you've lost a loved one, especially a parent or a sibling, you have an affinity for those that have lost, have suffered that same loss. Because it's something that you can relate to them, especially if you've overcome that feeling of remorse, that feeling of, many times, guilt. It's something you can relate to. I remember last week, uh, as I was talking to four daughters of a lady, I kept asking them, were they all right? Uh, Part of that was I realize now, in retrospect, a directive for me to be able to respond, you're going to be, you might not be all right right now, but you're going to be all right. You're going to make it. So, when you're not able to identify with somebody that's suffering, uh, it's because you haven't quite experience the same type of suffering. Those folk on Capitol Hill, uh, they've either forgotten the hardship, challenges, and suffering, and tragedy that other people have gone through, or they've always been privileged. There's a man right now that is suffering a major medical challenge. I can relate to that major medical challenge because I know God is a healer. Uh, It's through those challenges, those tragedies, that the walls of oppression are torn down. 
we usually get so busy fighting each other that we forget we're not entitled for anything. We're all entitled for one thing, though. We're all entitled to go to hell. But it was the grace and mercy of God that allowed us to serve, to redeem and transform the human race. Isaiah 55 and 8 says, I don't think the way you think. This is the Lord says. The way you work isn't the way I work. So how would you do it? How you would do whatever it is isn't how God would do it. In Romans 8, 28, New Living Translation says, And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. Because you don't see him working doesn't mean that he's not working. The proof is in the eating of the pudding. And then one of my favorite scriptures is 1 Peter 5 and 7, where it says, casting the whole of your care. Not just those things you pick and choose, but all your anxieties, all your worries, all your concerns, once and for all on him because he cares for you affectionately and cares about you watchfully. Take your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. Why? Because according to Exodus chapter 3, verse 7, he's seen the affliction of the people. He's heard our cries for deliverance, and he knows all about our pain. And now he's come down to help us. William C. Martin wrote, I trust in God wherever I may be, upon the land or a rolling sea. For come what may from day to day, my heavenly Father watches over me. He makes the rose an object of his care. He guides the eagle with the pathless air, through the pathless air. And surely he remembers me, my heavenly Father watches over me. I trust in God, for in the lion's den, on the battlefield or in the prison pen, through praise or blame, through flood or flame, my heavenly Father watches over me. The valley may be dark and the shadows deep, but oh, the shepherd guards his lonely sheep. And through the gloom, he'll lead me home. My heavenly father watches over me. Why? Because I trust in God. I know he cares for me. On mountain bleak or in the stormy sea, though billows roll, he keeps my soul. My heavenly father watches over me. So here's the question of the hour. When I don't understand why my prayer isn't answered, complete this statement. I will trust him because what? Star six to respond. When I don't understand why my prayer wasn't was not answered, I will trust him because Because I, I would can't trust him. Oh. Go ahead, please. Go ahead. I would trust him because he's he's come through before. Yes, sir. That's exactly what I was going to say. Many of I don't, don't have to look back that far to see only to now how he come through for me. Might not have been the way I wanted or when I thought, but he did cause for the fact that I'm still here. Yeah. Thanks, listen, Larry. Others? <laughs> okay. Uh, it is track record 
anybody that's got a proven track record, anybody that has shown me time and time again who they are, how they're going to respond to me, I can't help but believe them. And that's where we should be in our walk as well. So, we need to thank God for his caring and loving nature. No matter what we've done, no matter what we may be doing or will do, he still loves us and cares for us. You didn't do anything to make him love you more. You didn't do anything to make him love you less. He just loves you. We need to let others know that no matter how hard things may appear to be, God still cares for us. Yes, black lives matter. God cares for us and is in control. The evidence of the depth of Jesus' care was seen in Calvary. We need to share with those who don't know. And sometimes we need to remind folk that have forgotten how much Jesus cares. Your giving should always reflect how much you care. And although your prayer was not answered in the way you desired, just know that you got an answer. Why? Because you have a loving God, you have a caring God, and most importantly, you have a saving God. God does, God will answer prayers. Prayerfully, something's been said, something's been um, shared uh, that will have lightened your load, made you think a little bit different, because many times our thinking can go to, as Irv Owens used to say, stinking thinking which means that we, sh we don't need to think that way. We need to think about things that are pure, lovely, and just, and have good report. Uh, those are the things that we need to think about. Uh, God has pricked our hearts many times with a concern that we need to be in action about. And so until we start performing that action, that concern can kind of, as we found out last night, can cause us to be a little bit in unrest. So I want to encourage you to get busy. Yes, I know we're in COVID, but get busy. I love each and every one of you and can't wait to hear from you next week. Let's pray. Lord, we bless you, praise you, and magnify you for you're just an awesome God. Lord, we thank you for just being that awesome God. Lord, we, we can't make it without you. We can't exist without you. Uh, we need to give you all the praise, glory, and honor that is from our lives by living according to your will. I thank you, Lord, for the healing that you've begun. I thank you, Lord, for the healing that you're going to continue for many of us. And I thank you that the ultimate healing will uh, come eventually. Because one thing we know you to be is a healer. Lord, I thank you for the keeping power that you've given each and every one of us, Lord, because if it had not been for you keeping us, we wouldn't be making it. We wouldn't exist. We wouldn't have a moment's rest. 
And Lord, most of all, I thank you for being our Savior. I thank you that you saw the pitiful state that we were in and sent your son to die on the cross for us. Lord, we uh, love you. We bless you, praise you, and magnify you. You heard the request of your people asking you to move as only you can, request for healing, request for comfort, request for direction, request for peace, request for safety. Uh, Lord, I know that you many times need to use us as those vessels because we end up being your arms and legs. Or I just ask that you quicken our hearts that we may be obedient to the call that you place there. Lord, I bless you, praise you, and magnify you for this day. These things we ask in your mighty and majestic. Amen. 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 Amen.